I'm Amy McGovern. I'm a professor at the School of Computer Science and the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma and also directing this new NSF AI Institute, which is what I was asked to talk about. Um, in order to make it, you know, fit within time, um, normally when I do this, I ask for questions interactively. I'm going to try to take them all at the end. Um, I will say that the beginning part, when I'm talking about motivation, I'm going to I, this is probably a little bit of preaching to the choir, so I'm just going to go real fast on this part, which is just that the whole reason we're trying to make um, improve, and I think this also being an AI workshop and, and machine learning workshop, you already know this, but the reason we're trying to create this AI is specifically our overall personal motivation was to improve our resiliency to a changing climate. And so I just have some pictures of, you know, the things we can't control. We can't stop the tornadoes. We can't stop the hail, um, but we can improve our prediction and our understanding of them. And um, that, that is a probe that's going out to, understand, to uh, help study ocean eddies, which we're gonna talk about. Um, we have implications far beyond severe weather. We're also gonna talk about um, saving sea turtles and then uh, talk about tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So the other half of that motivation is just, you know, if you don't wanna talk about improving humanity's resiliency uh, to save lives, well, let's talk about saving property. The, billion dollar disasters are increasing. There's more people spread out in more places that are getting hit by more intense disasters. And this is the picture from just this year. It's already looking crazy. Of course, everybody says 2020, well, 2020, but this is gonna continue if you look at the graphs of the billion dollar disasters. So with the goal of trying to improve our resiliency, the other half of what we're trying to do and why we wanna use AI for it is that you know, there's a tremendous amount of data coming in constantly. There are new sensing systems coming online. There's an um, amazing amount of high resolution data, um, including uh, satellite, radar, you know, crowdsource data, et cetera. And sifting through all this data is really, really hard. And there's um, some work out there that shows that they're only using about 5% of the satellite data right now. And so if we could use more of that satellite data, then we could improve our predictions and our understanding and not throw away 95% of the data when some of that is probably valuable. Finally, before we talk about the Institute itself, um, and I'll slow down a little because I think the other stuff was probably more preaching to the choir, but this part might be something that you're not necessarily thinking about as much. The part of our name is that we're making trustworthy AI. And the reason that we're talking about trustworthy is that we care that the AI is actually used by the end users who will be using the AI. So it's not just creating new AI methods and throwing them over the fence. We're looking at the different kinds of end users, the different categories of end users, and the kinds of decisions that they need to make. So forecasters need to make life or death decisions often. Are they issuing a tornado warning? And then if you look at the two, the two uh, examples there, the three examples that I have, they're on different spatial and temporal scales. Do they issue tornado warning to evacuate a city for a hurricane or tornado warnings on a very short uh, time scale and a very small spatial scale evacuating a city for hurricanes on a much larger time scale. So those decisions and the, the, the implications of the matter for the AI that you're creating. And even though I started early, I see my timer is going on 20. So I'm going to not harp on the rest of this. Just say that the, the end user's needs really, really matter and that the the space and the time and the tolerance for mistakes also matter. So emergency forecast, emergency managers and forecasters may have different tolerance for mistakes, for example, than my final example on here, which is farming. And a corporate farm might have a more ability to tolerate an AI that has some more errors. Perhaps it's increased its probability of detection, but it's also increased the false alarms than say, for example, a family owned farm or perhaps even a forecaster. So the institute that we have created, um, this slide has all of our partners on it. And um, so our, our name, the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI in Weather, Climate, and Coastal Oceanography. Um, that's a bit of a mouthful. So we have a short version of it, which is AI2ES for AI to Environmental Science. And our goal is that we will uniquely benefit humanity by developing novel, physically-based AI techniques that are deemed to be trustworthy. And that trustworthy is deemed with the humans in mind and will directly improve prediction, understanding, and communication of the high-impact environmental hazards. And then I have all of our partners here on the slide of the Zoom windows on top of it. We have OU in the um, upper right hand corner. We are the leaders of the Institute, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi. And as I go through um, the further slides talking about what we're doing with our research, I'm going to talk about um, which, what you, each partner is leading. So we have Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, North Carolina State University, Colorado State University, University of Albany, University of Washington, Del Mar College. That's a uh, community college. And I um, I think actually in the interest of time, I took out their slide. So don't let me forget to say that they are a critical partner in our broadening participation plans. 
Um, so those are our university partners. And then we have NOAA as a federal partner. And then we have a federal funded research center. NCAR is one of our partners. And then we have four private industry partners that are involved right now. We've been approached by a number of others. We're working on that. Uh, but these four partners were part of our founding team and helped us to, to integrate and create this center, this institute. So Google, IBM, Disaster Tech, and NVIDIA. And if you want to learn more about us, we have a web page that we're growing content on, including something that I get asked for all the time when I give talks, which is putting in resources for how you can learn more about AI and machine learning. Um, and we have a Twitter page that um, is slowly starting to tweet more because it's just me. Okay, so I want to talk about what the Institute is actually doing and what we will be doing. So the research that we're going to be talking, that we're working on, we have three focuses of the research and they create a cycle. We have the foundational research in trustworthy AI and machine learning. We have use inspired research in environmental science and we have foundational research in risk communication. And then we also have our workforce development and broadening participation, which I said I took out in the interest of time. So the foundational research in trustworthy AI and machine learning, the three goals are that we're going to work on developing explainable AI methods that are aligned with environmental science domain perspective and priorities. And what I mean by that is that environmental science data is very different than traditional AI data. It's not IID most of the time. Uh, it's highly spatially and temporally autocorrelated. It's often rare, you know, the data, the phenomena that you care about are often rare phenomena, so the highly skewed data sets. Uh, there are a number of other uh, reasons that, AI, that environmental science data is different from traditional AI data, but we need to look at all of those reasons when we're developing our XAI methods. And then related to that, um, one of the key reasons that this data is very different is that we care about the physical based knowledge in the, the, the environmental science domains are all physical based. They need to, if you're going to create an AI and a machine learning method, they need to care about the physics. They need to create methods that are actually bounded based on the laws of physics. So they don't create pr predictions, for example, that are completely off the wall. And then the third goal that is tied into this is to develop robust predictions. And we don't necessarily have adversaries that are corrupting our data on purpose, but we have adversaries that are corrupting our data because they're weather. So I want to talk about those all briefly. Um, the first, the just examples of what we can do with XAI and environmental science, and then we'll be taking this further. This is examples of what we've already done, even um, just as members of the team. Uh, so think of this as preliminary results. Uh, the first one on the left, we have an application that's emulating radar imagery using uh, deep neural networks. So trying to take the GOES satellite data and create an estimate of what the radar data would look like if the radar was actually able to be observed everywhere that the, the satellite data is, which is not the case in the ocean. Um, and then using XAI methods to understand what the AI has learned to make sure that what the AI has learned is actually physically plausible to, so that you can actually trust what the AI is predicting given new satellite data. The one in the middle is looking at um, a prediction of hail storms and then looking inside the network to see what sort of optimal hail storms are and looking at the the inside of the network and seeing through observation, because there's this meteorologist looking at this, saying that looks like what we're going to call a supercell, what we're going to call a bow echo, what we're going to call a pulse storm. Those are the terms from the humans. The network didn't come up with that, but that that's what they look like inside the network. And then we're going to run those over the data that we have and see which one of those are active in different geographical areas. And what we come up with is that the things that look like pulse storms are much where we have much more frequent pulse storms. The things that look like supercells are where we have more frequent supercells, and the things that look like bow echoes are where we have more frequent bow echoes. And so it's conforming with our physical knowledge. And the third example I'm going to skip in the interest of time. Um, so moving from XAI techniques tying us into physically based techniques, uh, we want to make sure that we are conform that our AI techniques are conforming to the laws of physics, that we are both physically constraining the loss functions and physically constraining what the AI can actually learn. So this is going to end up creating novel architectures for both the machine learning methods and for the XAI. And the goal is that by incorporating the known laws of physics that we're going to improve both our predictions and our scientific understanding. Our ultimate goal will be to, to find new science of these physically based environmental science phenomena. And we have two examples here, one where we're taking um, really low resolution data at the nine kilometers and trying to create one kilometer grid data that is conforming to the laws of physics. And then the bottom example is looking at just a swing up task, just a pendulum, but trying to create a neural network that can learn the laws of physics and properly follow them. The third, um, the third part of that AI cycle, um, I talked about XAI and physically based AI, and we need to make sure that everything we're creating is robust. So it's robust both theoretically and empirically. 
So in the beginning, I was talking a little bit about how environmental data sets are limited by the different types of data that are different than AI, traditional AI data. And one of those is the adversarial nature of the data. And so we don't, in the traditional AI method, you have an adversary that could actually go out and corrupt your data on purpose. In the environmental science data, it isn't necessary that you have an adversary out there, but you might, for example, in this picture, have a tornado go out and corrupt your data. So this was a tornado that went through the El Reno mesonet, gave 151 mile an hour wind, uh, wind uh, gust reading. And if you were looking at this from a traditional AI perspective, you might just say, oh, that's an anomalous data reading. I'm going to throw it out. But in fact, it's not. But sometimes when you see those readings, they are anomalous and we need to be able to create our methods so they're robust in the cases where the data is anomalous and we throw it out in the cases where the data is actually real. And if you didn't believe this was real data, there's a picture of what our adversary has done to our sensor there. Um, and then we need to, to care about the fact that our data is highly skewed. You know, no matter how many tornadoes there are, there's still a very rare event. Same with hurricanes, same with, you know, any, pretty much any interesting phenomena that we're going to talk about. Um, so the second half, to, so part of the circle, we have the AI circle, and I've talked about that. I want to talk about the environmental science domains and then briefly about the risk communication. And what we want to do with the environmental science domains is we want to use the trustworthy AI to provide actionable information to a diverse set of users, and that actionable information will be trustworthy. And then we also want to enhance our physical and scientific understanding of these processes. So we have five application domains. Um, the first is convective weather. And those of you who've seen me give talks in the past have seen me talk about the convective weather. So, um, you know, I think that we know that convective weather con uh, produces hazards, rare hazards in the rare data, uh, tornadoes and hail. And we can, we've demonstrated over the last few years that we can use AI to improve the prediction of this. What we want to do now is to use the XAI and the physically based AI to improve our understanding of these phenomena so that we can create not just improved predictions, but improve scientific understanding of them. And I have an example up here of doing um, convolutional neural networks for tornado prediction and then looking at what the network learned and then using the neural networks. To, actually, that one's a random forest based um, approach to predict hail. Um, and both of those um, have references to places where you can learn more about them, given that I'm running out of time. The second domain is winter weather. And so with winter weather, we're studying uh, both snow and ice and other winter phenomena. And we're looking uh, both across the state of New York and the state of Oklahoma and trying to create AI methods that will improve our prediction and understanding of these different phenomena. And I was asked a question when I gave this talk last week about whether the weather was really different between Oklahoma and, and uh, New York. And I, I said yes, but I didn't explain it well enough. So I want to say the reasons we're developing across these two is not that I expect that ice behaves differently in the two places, but that the climatology of the two places is different. So by creating the forecasts that look across different climatologies, we're hoping to create a more robust um, AI method that will work across a variety of conditions. The third one is tropical cyclones, um, and tropical cyclones have a huge impact in terms of damage and flooding, and our goal is to use the AI um, to our, use our AI to improve the understanding uh, and the prediction of the rapid intensification. So we have an example down here of what we could do. Um, for example, you have polar orbiting satellites that give you microwave imagery, but they only give it to you a couple of times a day, but that microwave imagery can let you peer inside the hurricane. But the geostationary satellite, which can give you much more frequent data, is available every 10 to 15 minutes, but it can't see inside. And so we can train the deep neural network to understand, to mimic what the microwave imagery would have seen if it was available every 10 to 15 minutes, and thus created a synthetic data set of, the, of what the spatial structure of the hurricane or tropical cyclone looked like every 10 to 15 minutes, and then use that to improve our understanding of, of the evolution and, predict, and intensification of the tropical cyclones. Um, the fourth domain is subseasonal to seasonal prediction, and this is looking at the gap between, um, you know, predicting weather and predicting seasonal outlooks. And given that Libby is going to talk as her second keynote um, after the break, I am going to leave this slide here and tell you that Libby is going to talk more about this. The fifth domain is coastal oceanography, and here we're looking at coastal phenomena, and we have two different um, places that are leading it, and I forgot in the nature of trying to speed myself up on this talk and try not to talk too fast to tell you who was leading each of the previous efforts. The coastal oceanography is being led by two different locations, North Carolina State and Texas A&M. North Carolina State is looking at ocean eddies, which are sort of long-term, large-scale circulations in the ocean, harmful algal bloom prediction, and compound flooding. Texas A&M Corpus Christi is looking at um, I, I told you the, tea, the sea turtles were going to come back, so predicting and improving the prediction of uh, sea turtle sun, stunnings and coastal fog. 
and um, they already have a preliminary method in place that has shown that they can save lives of the sea turtles by improving the prediction of when it's going to be cold enough that the sea turtles are going to rise to the surface and then they can stop the traffic. Um, so given all that, we've got the trustworthy AI that's going to be working hand in hand with the environmental science domains, but all of this is keyed on the fact that we're creating a cycle. In order to call it trustworthy AI, we have the social scientists, the risk communication researchers, who are going to be studying what it actually means to be trustworthy. So they're going to be understanding what it, why people trust it, why different end users trust it in some situations and not at others, and doing experiments, changing the different methods and understanding how that changes the decision making on the part of the people who are actually using the AI. And so the risk communication that we have is key, and they will be doing interviews, and they'll be doing formative research and evaluative research um, with all of our end users. And we have a sampling of our end users here. These are different government agencies primarily, although through our private industry contracts, we're all, our contacts, we're also looking at some of the um, general public as well. But these are partnerships that we already have in place for a variety of different um, application domains um, so that we can look at different kinds of end users and understand what makes AI trustworthy for different kinds of end users. Because as I talked about in the beginning, forecasters and emergency managers probably have very different ideas. And, and then a National Park Service, which is on here, or the USGS, they all have very different ideas about what they need in terms of the AI. Um, so they'll be doing interviews and then experiments where they're varying the AI and then looking at causal effects on the trustworthiness. And um, this is my final slide so that we have the team. I think a lot of these people you probably know from this community. Um, we have the leaders for each one of the team, the, each one of the focus areas is shown at the top here, the trustworthy AI, the environmental science, the risk communication. And then I didn't talk about the broadening participation in workforce development. I'm glad to do so during questions. Uh, but if you want to ask any of us questions, um, you can do that. Libby's already up here and she's giving her keynote and uh, relatively soon. And then um, the members of each one of these teams are also shown down below with just last names. And so we're all glad to talk to you about the Institute. And I think I've stopped there so that I can answer questions and I will get out of full screen mode so I can get to chat. Great, so um, I assume we'll have quite a few questions. If not, I'm sure I will have quite a few. <laughs> yeah, and I can't seem to make the Zoom window come back. There we go, got it. <laughs> Yeah, okay. to move around a little bit. Um, so people feel free to put your questions into chat um, or into the q and I'll kind of monitor both. And you can start off, you said you had questions since there aren't yeah, any in the chat. So, I mean, and do you want me to stop the... screen sharing, by the way? Huh? Do you want me to stop screen sharing? I think it's fine. Okay. Um, so do you have a feeling for which of the, like what a timeline looks like in terms of making progress on each of these different Categories, right? So I know I've seen some stuff from some of the collaborators on this that's essentially ready right now. Some that's maybe a little longer term. Do you have a feeling on like where the first results will come from? Uh, yeah, I mean, as, as you say, some of this stuff is already more mature than some of the others. Um, we actually are in the process of figuring out who's going to go first in terms of tying into the risk communication. And the, um, the convective group is going to go first because we already have, I think, the most mature set of results because we've already gone all the way through to testing in the hazardous weather test beds. So we use the end, you know, talk to the end users. We've already adjusted what we've been doing in terms of trustworthy. So that's probably where the results are going to come out first. Um, the next two groups we're focusing on are coastal oceanography and winter. And then tropical cyclones and S2S are going to come a little bit later. Okay. Um, so the first question is, can you say a little more about how you define explainable AI? Um, that's an excellent question. So we're defining it. And why did I not turn everything off? Sorry. All of my devices are ringing. Um, we're defining trustworthy AI or explainable AI based on the based on the end user. So it's, it involves both the visualizations that I didn't have a chance to talk about, but they were just a little bit on that one slide about visualizations of what's learned inside the network, as well as, you know, figuring out when the network is working, why that, why the different machine learning methods are working. So you might be doing the visualizations and expl explanations of why something went wrong, as well as why something went right. Because in my experience in working with forecasters, they care a lot about why things are wrong. They, if the model's working right 90% of the time, they're sort of like, great, that's great. Why is it not working those 10% of the time? What can we do to focus on that? And so the explainable AI method are looking a lot at why it went wrong. Um, that's, that's, I can't tell if that countdown timer is going to cut me off in eight seconds or not, but no, it's no, about no, as much as I got. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You, we've got five more minutes till the next Okay. Time. 
Um, if that wasn't enough of an explanation, let me know. <laughs> I, I think we'll, I think that was good. Um, so could you please comment on applications of 3D convolutional nets um, in combination of techniques like random forests? Uh, for example, I see they were used in the turtles example. Oh, that's an interesting question. The, um, the, the conv nets are not mixed together with the, the random forest right now. It's mostly that the random forest techniques have been used as preliminary results and then we're moving to deep learning results. So with the hail work, for example, and with the turtle work, they were doing traditional AI techniques first and then they're looking at what can they do to improve the techniques and will convolutional nets improve those techniques. They're not being used to mix together. So um, can I add to that one a little bit? So are you guys doing mostly like uh, 2D CNN type stuff with multiple channels or are you guys actually doing like 3D CNN? Um, the tornado work is 3D. So we're using 3D radar data for the tornado work. Um, the, tur the turtle work is not mine and I don't know if any of them are online and can comment in the chat. So as far as I know, the turtle stuff is 2D right now. Um, we have, with the hail work, we're also pro moving to 3D as well. So, so I that's, think the that's like three actual convolutional directions or just? Yeah, uh, and actually using the full state of the atmosphere. So with the, with the tornado work, we've got the merged radar data available at all the levels. And so we're using all the levels because it, it turns out when you just look at composite, it doesn't work as well. And it also creates less interpretable AI. Okay. Um, so we actually saw an improvement in performance and in interpretation. Well, uh, another one is interested in how you would interrogate what the AI has learned to help what humans can learn from them. Um, yeah, that gets into the questions asking more about explainable AI. So I didn't give methods. Um, you know, right now the preliminary results we have are using existing methods, saliency maps, gradient, uh, grad cam, cam, uh, uh, backwards optimization, uh, LRP, there's probably a method that I'm missing in there. Uh, but th that's what we've been doing right now. We're working on making those methods more physically based and also creating our own methods. Sure. Um, can you discuss more on what the workforce preparation looks like? Ah, yes. That's the slides I had to cut out in the nature of time. So Delmar is creating an AI certificate that is going to be a five course uh, certificate that will do um, so community college uh, level that you can take that, you get an AI certificate, you can go immediately go out and get a job. Um, it'll be AI for geosciences. Um, also, uh, it could transfer directly to university if you want to continue on on that. So that's one level of the workforce preparation. Um, and it's also specifically aimed at the minority audience because Del Mar and Texas A&M are Hispanic serving minority serving institutions. And we want to make sure that what we're creating is going to improve diversity. It's not just lip service. We want to make sure it really works. Um, but we're also doing a number of online tutorials and classes. I'm teaching in the spring an AI and ethics and geoethics class, and that will be available online. So everything that we're creating will be available on our website. Um, an example of one of those, uh, David Gagne at NCAR created the AI for Earth Summer School, and we just linked that into our webpage. A whole bunch of us from the Institute taught at that, inst at, at that summer school this summer. We're gonna continue to create more of those things and we'll be linking them in. Um, we also are doing K-12 outreach. If you're interested in that, talk to me as well. None of that's online yet, but it will be. Um, so following up on the explainable questions, what strategies are you using to integrate visualizations from a project management perspective? So do you involve experts on specific visualization methods or do you have infrastructural codes or? That's an interesting question. I don't think about it. I'm thinking the answer to that is at the technical level of the, of the, you know, which methods they are, the project management level. Uh, we are the experts on a bunch of those methods and we're also creating them. So I, I would say we're involving the experts because we're the, the AI part of the AI research of this are the experts who are creating those visualization techniques and creating the codes. And we're going to be open sourcing everything, by the way, um, so that we're using them and then we're working directly with the risk communication researchers. And if there's more to that, I'm not sure what else to, uh, to answer. Sure. And then maybe a final one. Can you talk a little bit more about skewness in the environmental data? What are possible solutions? And I'll add class and balance to that as well. And this will be the last question. Okay, I think those are, um, yeah, skewness in the environmental data is, is huge. And I think that we all know that, you know, if we're looking to predict tornadoes at any given space and time, there's not a tornado most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time. So we're looking at a variety of methods, um, starting with just sampling, you know, smoke, different kinds of sampling, but also uh, theoretically adjusting the loss techniques so that we can make sure that it's really caring about these minority classes without still over predicting them. Um, I, I think that's about Given the time, I think that's about it for right now. I will point you at some, some uh, publications that'll be coming up on some of that.